So today I would like to present a uniqueness theorem for minimal surfaces. For minimal surfaces, that means surfaces with mean curvature zero in a boundary configuration. Gamma S, which is partially free, and uh, S is a kind of cylinder surface, so it's a, a product with a, of a directrix and the real line. So we imagine that we are in uh, three-dimensional space, and I take a certain plane, which I take as x1, x2 plane, and in this plane I have a curve sigma naught, two points, little p1 and p2, and a curve, another curve with endpoints on sigma, which I call gamma sub bar, and uh, this arc on sigma naught between p1 and p2, uh, I call sigma, and sigma together with gamma bar bound a domain, which is not assumed to be convex, so in here, could be quite complicated, but this part of the boundary, gamma bar, is supposed to be convex with respect to the domain G. Uh, G, I suppose, is a Jordan arc of class C2 alpha, so representable with, uh, by a re with a regular representation of class C2, second derivatives, held or continuous, and the same for uh, sigma alpha, a number between 0 and 1. Just for technical reasons, so that the objects I'm considering have sufficiently many derivatives. <coughs> um, now, what I'm going to consider is, say, x1, x2, x3 axis, and uh, here, we have the cylinder surface S, <coughs> and we have an arc gamma uh, with, uh, with endpoints capital P1 and capital P2, and I assume that P1 lies uh, over the point little p1 on this, so this is sigma naught and p2 over a little p2 and uh, the green arc projects in, oh, in a 1-1 one, one way onto gamma bar. So the green curve gamma is supposed to lie as a graph above gamma bar and it's also of class uh, uh, C2 alpha. And uh, I want to consider minimal surfaces which are spanned into the configuration gamma S considering, consisting of this Jordan arc gamma and of the cylinder surface S. <coughs> so minimal surface having a free boundary on the cylinder surface S. Uh, so the surfaces I'm considering are functions of two real variable, or as I write it sometimes, of one complex variable with values in R3, three components, capital X1, X2, X3, and I, I'm looking at minimal surface of the topological type of the disk, and I choose as parameter domain to make it more suggestive, a semi-disk, and I assume that this arc, C, is mapped in a, by all admissible surfaces uh, in a monotonic way 
onto this Jordan arc, and if they are minimal surface, then they then will be automatically topological mappings of C onto gamma. Why do you think this code is, it's, it's very special, this problem? It is very small. and then uh, the and so why, why do you think this? Is it a physical reason or? Uh, sure. Uh, as I told you, in general, there is no uniqueness. And this is, so to say, the first generalization from uh, a fixed closed Jordan curve to something which has a, f a free boundary. Now, in general, in general, to convince you, uh, the last time, the last time I drew you already an example of a. <coughs> of a free boundary configuration which has denumerably many non-concurrent solutions. But it can be even worse. Say you take a sphere and uh, stationary minimal surface means always uh, it's a minimal surface intersecting the free boundary uh, transversally under a right angle. Now, all circles in a sphere which pass through its di diameter are minimal surfaces and they are intersecting the sphere orthogonally. So you see here you have a man many parameter family of minimal surfaces, no chance. And uh, uh, there's basic, in the moment there is no idea how to estimate the number of minimal surfaces. The only chance you have is uh, representing, except for that Nietzsche theorem, uh, where I gave you the idea of the technique to prove it, the only chance is to show that the minimal surface can, under certain conditions, be represented as a graph of a function. And when you have this, uh, then you know it's a solution of the non-parametric minimal surface equation and then you have to derive certain boundary conditions and then you can apply something like Hopf, Eberhard Hopf technique. Often this doesn't function because you have singularities, then you must uh, do certain integral estimates which are so to say a, a, a substitute for Hopf's boundary problem that has been invented by Johannes Nietzsche. Uh, so this is the only uh, technique uh, <coughs> to give you another impression uh, how many solutions can appear. Uh, if you have one circle, there's only one minimal surface, a disk. If you have two circles, well, then you have this minimal surface, or you have this, the catenoid which is just bent a little bit in, and then you have the <coughs> If the two circles are sufficiently close to each other, then besides this one, you have another catenoid, this one. So in general, you have one, two uh, connected, or uh, three, because there's always this disconnected. So you have three, two, or one solution. In general, uh, you have only this solution, namely this one. So they're far apart. If they are far apart. Now, if you have three circles, what then? Three circles, I claim uh, there are infinitely many minimal surfaces, <coughs> which are now minimal surfaces of the disk, they are parametrized over such a domain. These uh, <coughs> catenoids, they are parametrized uh, over an annulus. Now I want minimal surfaces that are bounded by three uh, parallel disks. Uh, so they are parametrized over such a, a domain. I claim if you have one circle or two circles, uh, then uh, you have only those minimal surfaces I have described here. Uh, actually, that these rotational symmetric ones are the only ones is not easy to see. This is a famous theorem which has been proved by uh, Rick Shane. Uh, now, what about three circles? The, the claim is then you have already a whole one parameter family of solutions. Uh, I give you the idea how to prove this. 
uh, you take a circle, you take close by another circle, uh, you cut it by half, then you have a half circle plus the connecting line, very close together. Then uh, you can span, if this distance here is sufficiently small with respect to one, uh, you can span a connected minimal surface of the type of the ring in here. Uh, so it gets down here. It's not so easy to see. So uh, roughly speaking, this minimal surface, if you had shoes like an elephant, uh, circle of shoes and you cut off the, the sole, then you can think of uh, this is the minimal surface with this part here, uh, linear part. And, and now you do the following. Now you reflect the whole configuration at this line. Uh, then you have a reflection principle for minimal surfaces, which is a generalization of Schwarz's reflection principle, which tells you uh, if you reflect along this line, uh, this line here will not be any more singularity, but you have reflected it as a minimal surface across the whole thing. So the new thing uh, is added here. The upper circle goes down. Well, and now imagine yourself, it's just taking your two shoes, taking out, cut the soles off and put them together, and there you have a kind of uh, unsymmetry, and then you turn it around, and you have a one parameter family of minimal surfaces. So you see, uh, it's very hard to foretell. No one knows what to expect. So uh, I admit it is very small progress, but it is some progress. Mm -hmm. And one cannot uh, right. And one cannot prove more than is true. Uh, so if I want to prove something which is correct, I have to assume a certain situation. Of course, instead of proving a uniqueness theorem by something sitting as a graph over a plane, I can think of it as sitting graph over a convex body or maybe over the sphere. These are all legitimate things, but then uh, more complicated systems uh, will turn up and uh, no one yet has uh, worked such things out uh, <coughs> except for the sphere case. Uh, that's a lot of proof. Uh, okay. Uh, so what I'm uh, going to do is a uniqueness theorem which in case that free boundary is not there, that means in case that the two points P1 and P2 fall together, it will be just Rado's uniqueness theorem. Uh, <coughs> now I make the, f the general assumptions I have stated. Now I uh, write down two assumptions. A and B. And I'm not going to formulate them in words, but just in pictures. Uh, A is the weaker assumption. There I don't get uniqueness. And I will show by an example that I have only A, but not B. There is no uniqueness. So let's assume here is G. And assumption A says, if I look, uh, well, in A I just look at the normal lines uh, the normal lines to sigma naught in these two endpoints P1 and P2. Since these two normal lines uh, meet uh, no, I should uh, say in this way uh, G, the domain G lies between these two normal lines. These two lines L1 and L2, here you have a right angle, do not meet G. That's all. Assumption B requires more. So this is A. B requires more. Here's the domain G. It's the two endpoints. And if I take the perpendiculars, either here, 
not, not between these two points, or I take the perpendicular over here. And such a perpendicular hits uh, the closure of G union sigma naught only in the point where I draw the normal, nowhere else. So for instance, uh, condition B would not be satisfied if the situation is like this. No, that's not good. Sorry. Make it more instructive. Make a little curvature here. So here are the two points, and uh, if I draw these normals, uh, then G lies between, so no problem. But if I draw a normal over here, it intersects sigma naught on the other side. Or if I draw it here, well, it's even worse the situation. So this is a situation where condition A, but not condition B, is satisfied. Uh, now let me give you the zero. assumption B together with the other assumptions I have had written down, <coughs> then there exists exactly one minimal surface bounded by gamma and S and uh, which is stable, which is uh, freely stable which is freely stable and stationary in the configuration. Gamma S. Stable under perturbation zone comes. I have not yet defined. This uh, is a little bit complicated. It's a very natural uh, notion I will show you, uh, but I have to get a little bit into details. Now, I'm not claiming that there exists exactly one minimal surface at all which is stationary, but it's a uniqueness theorem amongst the freely stable ones. If you remember the example I had written down the last time, uh, there I have, it's of course a slightly different situation and my theorem doesn't apply to it, but just to give you the idea, I had one minimal surface which sits like a graph over here. This was a quarter turning of the helix, so the helicoid, and then I had denumerably many minimal surfaces just by making a number n plus one quarter windings, uh, and they are all sitting over this domain. They project all to the server down, but except for this quarter turning one, the other ones are no minimizers. So there's just one minimizer, and the other one are unstationary, there are denumerably many. So that tells you this is not such a bad assumption. And, uh, uh, <coughs> and I want to say this 
uh, minimal surface whose existence I claim. And this is the, the weaker part of the theorem. The, the stronger part is that there exists exactly one. This minimal surface, this minimal surface X is the absolute minimizer of Dirichlet's integral and of the area functional uh, in the class C gamma S. Moreover, uh, it is the graph of a solution <coughs> say uh, z equals zeta of x, y. If I write it in this way, it would be idiotic to use x1, x2, and x3, so I use then y and z. For these three coordinates, it's the graph of a solution of the non-parametric minimal surface equation. And maybe you allow me that I do not write this equation. No, but maybe there are some some listeners today here. Which weren't here the last time, so I write it down. So it's one plus zeta y squared, zeta x x minus zeta x zeta y to zeta x y plus one plus zeta x squared zeta y y equals zero. So this is the minimal surface equation uh, on uh, over G. So the minimal surface lies a, like a graph over this uh, domain G over here and satisfies the following boundary condition. Uh, the normal derivative of zeta uh, is zero uh, on sigma, which just express, expresses the fact that it intersects this red surface uh, orthogonally, and zeta over gamma bar is a prescribed curve gamma. This is the curve gamma which prescribes the arc gamma which lies over this convex curve. So, uh, uh, uniqueness, of course, you will say it's not unique because I can, uh, uh, behind x, uh, I can always compose x with a self-mapping, a holomorphic self-mapping of the uh, semi-disk, and this is a minimal surface as well. Uh, <coughs> Uh, well, uh, of course, always up to conformal equivalence. And this is not exactly the surface I have here, but I have uh, introduced uh, special parameters. So in the sense of the differential geometry, this representation is equivalent to the representation up there. So this is uh, theorem one. Uh, please. The green curve on top. Gamma is x, y, z. Where z is gamma of x, y is x, y taken off gamma bar. So gamma is the graph of little gamma sitting over gamma bar. That's what it is. You want to give stationary. stationary? Stationary, okay. Stationary, so minimal surface means, just recall this, uh, harmonic and conformal parameters. This is a condition in B, but basically it's a boundary condition. 
so this is also a stationarity condition, which you see if you apply Aminoita's theorem. Uh, <coughs> however, uh, this is all what you get out if you have a fixed arc as a boundary. However, if you have a free uh, part of an arc, then uh, a minimal surface could sit like this or like that, or could have a right angle, or could make no angle at all. And uh, what comes out is if something is stationary uh, along the admitted variations at the free boundary, then it must be a right angle. So stationary is another word for intersecting perpendicularly. But note, if you make an existence proof, uh, you minimize the stuff uh, really in a, in a Zobolev space. You have no boundary values uh, on the free boundary. In the be very beginning, you have no idea what the free boundary is. That could be a, a very ugly point set, could be a fat point set of positive Hausdorff measure. You have to prove that it has a nice, smooth representation. And even less, you could speak of an angle. So being stationary, you have to formulate in a weak way. But of course, I cannot give you all the technical details. So just please allow me that I speak in a certain descriptive way, and of course it has to be filled in with all the analytical details. But stationary means intersecting the free boundary perpendicularly, at least in a weak sense. So it's a natural condition? For a natural condition, it has to be. Every minimizer, every local minimizer will satisfy it, or everything uh, which makes the first variation zero among, if you admit variations, see, if you have a free boundary, then it's not clear where, say, one dimension less, you have a curve which starts here and ends on an arc gamma. It's not clear whether it should end here or should end there. So you must admit variations along this arc. And this will give you an extra condition. And this extra condition is a free boundary condition. And this is the condition of being perpendicular. This I should have said. Thank you for your question. So, theorem two. I make it better. I have not so much space. Theorem two comes in red. If condition A is satisfied, uh, then there exists a minimal surface, but it's not necessarily unique anymore. And uh, uh, this is then not necessarily true anymore, but it can be represented as a graph. Now, this theorem 2 is very cheap once I have theorem 1. Uh, I tell you why. If uh, this is a configuration which satisfies condition uh, A but not B, so I do the following. I cut off all this and all that. And I just extend and make a new surface, sigma naught. And I apply to this new configuration, theorem 1, and I get a solution. And this solution is a graph, and this is a theorem which has not been known uh, in this strength uh, so far. And uh, because it sits in there, does not overshoot here with its free boundary, it's also a solution of the original problem. Okay, now you might ask, uh, couldn't that be unique? I claim, in general, it will not be unique. Here's my picture to show you why it's not unique. Um, <coughs> so you see uh, that these questions are really quite subtle. One has to be very careful. Um, <coughs> take a surface S, which looks like the cover of a book. So this is 
this. Uh, which is sigma naught times uh, r. And sigma naught is roughly this curve, which I had drawn here. So it sits as a curve over such a line sigma naught. And then, uh, if this, uh, like in a book, where the end is very flat, so if this were really flat, then it would be quite suggestive to you. Uh, if I do the following, I take an arc, which is perpendicular here, I go down here, and then I go back. So this arc projects just to such a line. This line is the projection of this, this point, this line goes all on this point and going back, it's the same line. So it's not quite what I want. However, you see clearly, here's the minimal surface, uh, which is not yet my graph. But now I make the following. I move this point here a little bit to this direction, and this point I move a little bit to this direction. Uh, so if I, and then so this tilts a little bit, goes down, goes backwards, so the projection will now be something looking like this. Still, if this was flat, you still have this kind of minimal surface sitting in here, uh, uh, intersecting perpendicularly this uh, planar part. Uh, so, and the projection is this. So this is the thing I construct in theorem two. However, now think that the book is very small, very small book. Uh, then this is definitely not the optimum for the area. But what the a soap film, if you wanted to span it in here, would do is the soap film would just go to the side, uh, go down, and come back to here. So you get something like a very thin color, such a thing, going from here to the boundary. And if you make this very small, you can make this color as small as you please. And you see this sits definitely not as a graph over here. And because it overshoots, so uh, uh, this type of surface would have a free boundary which projects over here. So it overshoots has this free boundary not uh, uh, enclosed in this little domain. <coughs> so if I want to prove such a theorem, I really need a tool uh, to prevent this to happen, to push this off. And for this, there is condition B. And uh, you see, that's exactly what condition B does. Uh, now you can think of it as once I have such a condition B, I can apply maximum principle. I can form the linear function which describes this real line, compose it with the minimal surface, push to the side, and then I can push it inward until I hit these two points, just because of this non-intersecting condition. Uh, and as soon as this condition is violated, well, then there might be there can be minimal surfaces within the free trace which overshoots in the projection. And then you have actually two solutions. And if you make this symmetric, uh, you could reflect it to the other side. You have even three solutions, two absolute minimizers and one uh, uh, relative minimizer, because this kind of thing here is uh, quite intuitively seen as a relative minimizer. And then you have, of course, stationary solutions. So you see you are quite in trouble if you wanted to estimate the number of solutions. How, what should be the geometric quantities telling you the number of solutions is at most this or at least that? No one knows uh, what to do. So already these simple types of geometric variational problems have an, might have an incredible number of solutions. They might be congruent, non-congruent, enumerable, there might be whole continua. Uh, there's no way uh, to say a priori, in general, uh, how many solutions you have. So once you have such a mildly nonlinear problem, like minimal surfaces, you have to give up the idea 
uh, you have one solution, two, you have who knows how many solution. So this is a theorem one. Now I should look at my watch. Okay. technique as I proposed already in the theorem is to show that the minimal surface is a graph over the domain G. Now of course if you want to do this uh, it's natural to consider the following. You consider x1, x2, x3. Uh, so this is the mapping of into R3 and then you project the surface down onto the x1, x2 plane. That is, you take the mapping consisting only of the first two components. Uh, if you cut off one function, it's still harmonic, but of course the conformality uh, condition has disappeared. Now I'm in a situation as I described it two days ago in the theorem of Knesa Rado, where I have harmonic mappings of domains onto domains and I want to show that they are diffeomorphisms. Yet for the moment I do not know that they are mappings of domains onto domains. So what I really would like to have is that F maps the domain B onto the domain G. And I would like to have that the mapping is in such a way that the boundary is mapped in a one-to-one -one way onto the boundary of this domain. Then I have to chance to generalize Knesa's theorem. So the one difficulty is to show that this is a one-one mapping. Now, uh, in general, it's not true. No hope uh, to prove such a thing, only in this special situation. However, if the thing overshoots the, the free boundary of the minimal surface, projected down, goes down here or goes up here, it clearly the whole thing cannot sit as a graph over the domain G. So I have to prevent that it overshoots. Applying maximum principle tells me, well, really, the S finishes here and it finishes here. So this is, as a first step, okay. The next step, what is not too difficult, needs some ideas, uh, that the mapping from here to here is a topological mapping. <coughs> so should draw the picture. Uh, C onto gamma bar <coughs> is topological. Uh, for this, I use the assumption that gamma bar is convex with respect to G. Again, Hopf's maximum, uh, Hopf's lemma with the normal positive. Uh, this is the, one of the standard tools one always uses here. Uh, shows me after some arguments that this mapping is really topological. This is not uh, very difficult. What is really difficult is to show that the mapping from this interval i to this part sigma, the closure of it, so, so, ah. Uh, yeah, let me take the, the, the open part, the, the open interval i, excluding these points onto sigma, is a topological mapping. Even the speed, if sigma is parametrized over i, the speed is f u, uh, u, and u runs over here, this is positive. It's the right orientation, otherwise negative. Uh, how could that be true? Uh, 
Well, I dispose of this question for a moment. Uh, just assume that I had proved this. Then uh, the next thing, of course, the, the um, surface F, which I'm considering, I would like to know that the surface maps B into G, which is not at all clear. So far I have spoken only of the mapping of the boundary. Now again, by using the maximum principle, uh, always pushing planes uh, towards the whole thing, this sits in the a, in a cylinder surface, uh, certainly tells me that the minimal surface X does not overshoot here. This is okay. But it might overshoot here, or it might have holes in there. And these holes and the overshooting, I must rule out. So this should not occur, and this should not occur. And then I have to know that also this is a uh, topological mapping. And uh, if this all would work well, then I would have a chance applying Knesset's theorem telling me F is F considered as a mapping from B prime to G prime is a homeomorphism and F restricted to B so as a mapping from B to G is a diffeomorphism. Actually, I'm going to prove this and even more. I prove that it as a mapping from B union I, so together with this line. Uh, yeah, even more. I prove B prime at minus the two endpoints. Minus one, plus one. Minus one, plus one. Uh, to G prime minus the two endpoints. P1, P2 is a different office. So I extend that even up to the boundary. Now that's quite tricky. And what is the idea? So if I had this, I would take X3, the third component, compose it with the inverse of F, and would call this zeta. And this would be a non-parametric non-parametric representation of, of x as a graph over g because x sits in here and f is a mapping from here to uh, g uh, so f goes this way, f to the minus 1 goes this way. And composing it with the third component, well, I have a function which is defined over here. And as the whole thing has developed, it should be the non-parametric representation of my minimal surface. Now, how uh, do I have the chance to prove such a thing, that this is a diffeomorphism. What is the key step? The, the key idea is, as I told you the last time, to consider the normal. And one, and two, and three, the Gauss map, which is uh, one over W uh, times XU, XV. And W is the length of this expression. Uh, so this is the unit normal, which might have singularities and might uh, applying the, the existence proof which I have, so far I have discrete branch points. Nevertheless, it turns out because I have asymptotic representations, uh, there is a unique normal. Even if a domain locally is covered around this branch point several times, I have, so to say, a generalized tangent plane. And so the normal, also it looks irregular, is a continuous function, and even better, it is a solution of a, an elliptic nonlinear system of the type n la, minus Laplace n times n is equal n times gradient n squared. And if the solutions are continuous and the solution has a finite Dirichlet integral, 
uh, the u dv. This is exactly uh, at factor one half that by Gauss Bonnet. Uh, this is exactly as I showed you the total curvature by Gauss Bonnet theorem. I can estimate this. This stuff is finite. So I can apply regularity theory for such type of systems. And since I have already continuity, I know the solution is uh, as nice as the equation that means real analytic. So the whole thing is real analytic. So these are exactly three equations. Uh, minus Laplacian n of the third component satisfies n3 times gradient n squared. This is the elliptic equation satisfied by the third component. Now, I make a picture in a dimension less. If I have a surface which looks like this, then it clearly it cannot be a graph over a domain down there. Yeah, I project it down. If it wants, has to be a graph, well, it should be looking like this. What does it mean for the normal? It means that the normal has to lie in a hemisphere. Uh, so, for instance, n3 greater 0. Uh, so if I want to have a chance at all as representing the minimal surface as a graph over the domain G, I have to prove the third component, that's the one which points perpendicular to the domain G, this third component is to be positive. How do I prove this? There the notion of stability comes in. Now I do the following. Uh, one makes variations, after all it's calculus of variations, so I make a variational family. Here is the given minimal surface. I add uh, one parameter family of perturbations, lambda, times the Gauss mapping. Uh, and if one has uh, plateau boundary conditions, one usually assumes that lambda is a function of class C1 with compact support on B. That means you vary only somewhere in the interior. And at the boundary, you leave it fixed because you don't want to destroy the plateau boundary condition. Now it's different. Uh, now you are not supposed to vary around here, but along this part of the boundary, which corresponds to values uh, sitting on the cylinder, there you should vary. Now, if you add here a normal, and if the normal uh, of the surface does not point into the, uh, if, it, it, if it points wrongly, uh, it can lead you out of the surface. So just making this simple type of corrections is not enough. So you should add a correcting term. It turns out you do well with a correcting term of a certain function c, which you have to determine, and you determine it on here by some computation in a unique way, what it should be. And then there come higher order terms, little o of epsilon squared. So you make such variations. Now, <coughs> if you form the area of x epsilon, being stationary means the first derivative, for every type of such uh, variation, lambda, an arbitrary function, is zero. Uh, and if it's a minimum, well, then the second derivative is supposed to be uh, no negative. So then the area looks like this. Uh, <coughs> Now, these equations lead you to the minimal surface equation. Uh, let me tell you there are certain difficulties because you have these branch points. These formulas I'm going to write down, I'm a little bit careless because there are singularities. 
However, uh, although these singularities are there, there's a trick that one can remove them into integrated form because of this condition. So there are some extra manipulations around such a singularity. You have always to put something like a funnel, and this funnel make you always smaller. Well, these are well-known tricks uh, applying to this. Uh, anyway, everything functions. Now, if you write this down, then you get the following. And uh, since my time is short, I cannot give you my whole computation. I give you just the result. Uh, If you compute uh, this second derivative, you get the following expression. Gradient lambda squared plus 2e, so this is the length of xu squared, the Gaussian curvature, lambda squared, du dv. And this expression is what is usually called the second variation of the area of the minimum surface x in direction lambda, rather than direction lambda times n, but n need not to write here. So this is the expression uh, what one uses uh, when one considers minimum surface with fixed plateau boundary condition and minimizes satisfy this. However, this would not be the correct notion of the second variation because now I can freely vary at the boundary. Being a minimum means more, and this being more adds an other integral, and this other integral is a boundary integral. So what you gain extra is that this plus a certain boundary integral integral along i. Uh, this is uh, greater or equal to zero for minimizers or for local minimizers. And so I introduced the notion of free stability that this expression, where I now allow lambda b of class c1 is compact support in b union i. So it's zero around here, but can be non-zero on such a domain. Uh, what is this extra term? So this boundary integral. This boundary integral and I don't, since I'm <coughs> not deriving it, I better copy it. It's an ugly term, and you think one has never a chance to do anything with it. It's lambda squared times kappa of x times n times tangential vector x interior product squared times inner product of xv with nx du over i. This is the expression which comes over here. So you had to, it comes out uh, completely natural. It's nothing artificial. So what are these terms n to kappa? So if you think uh, here's in the plane the curve sigma naught. Well, you have tangential vector, uh, which I call tor. You have a normal vector, which I call n. And you have the curvature on each point, which I call kappa. This is now only defined on the curve. And I, then I t extend it by translation up and down with the same value on each real line sitting over these points to the cylinder, and then I extend it to the space somehow. 
So this are these surfaces which come up over here. And being freely stable means that this plus this term is greater or equal to zero for all lambda is compact support in here. Now what is this good for? Now I take, now I, what do I want to show? I want to show that n3 is greater zero. So I look at the function omega, which I call n3. Let's try it. And then I take omega minus. Omega minus is omega or zero. It's uh, uh, omega uh, where omega is positive and it's zero where omega, uh, sorry, it's omega where, ome where omega is uh, less than zero and it's zero where omega is greater or equal to zero. W. Omega of W. Understand? So here, to draw a picture, if omega would like this, uh, then omega minus would be this function. Now, uh, omega is very nice. I put it in a Lipschitz function. Then it's of course not any more nice, but it's still it's a composition. Uh, of a nice function with a Lipschitz function, I still have some kind of chain rule, even a pointwise, as one can prove. And of course, now I apply this formula even to this function. And then I do the following. I introduce a real valued function phi of i s. To have a name for this, I call this the generalized second variation or the free second variation of the area at x in direction of lambda. And then here I take uh, this expression, second variation at x, and for lambda I take omega minus plus epsilon phi. Phi is a function with compact support in B. So it has no boundary values. Possible boundary values are in here. And uh, so this is an admissible lambda. And now I use the condition of free stability that tells me this term is greater or equal to zero. Now comes a real miracle. The real miracle is that f of zero is zero. Why is that? If you look at this over here, uh, from this term here, uh, this first part, a partial integration, uh, you write as minus Laplace lambda plus uh, 2 e uh, k lambda, there's a factor of 2 times lambda. Of course, it's all cheating. Uh, 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 okay, uh, this I now apply first to lambda equals omega minus. Now assume that omega minus were nice. Uh, then I would have this term, and there comes a boundary term, which is uh, lambda times the normal derivative, but uh, uh, it's the inner normal in v direction, so it's a minus sign over here, integration over u. Now remember, uh, Laplacian of n, minus equals uh, n times gradient n squared. That's the equation satisfied by n. So the third component satisfies this. And this expression is up to a factor, this one, 
Uh, so uh, from this equation, third component, this tells me that this expression is zero. There comes this boundary term. Now that's the fact that just every component of the Gauss map is, uh, or the, yeah, uh, the Gauss map is a Jacobi field. This is the way how I could express it. Then there comes this boundary term, uh, goes together with this boundary term. So uh, you have a certain expression, lambda v minus this term, and the factor lambda, you can in front of the parenthesis, so you have a lambda v minus something times lambda. And now the amazing thing is the third component of the normal uh, makes this zero. You have to believe that. Uh, for a while we were stuck here because we never believed that such a thing could happen. Uh, but eventually we took uh, courage and computed and it turned out to be zero. That's the miracle. Now, since we have this miracle, that means you have a real valued function, which is zero over here. That means the derivative of this is zero. Well, uh, if you write down the derivative, now it would be very easy if I would work with omega. Instead, I work with omega minus. So actually, I'm not working over the whole domain, but I'm working over this part of the domain. There are various ways to, to write down the partial integration in a generalized form, but it's correct. Uh, doing this tells me uh, that this is zero. That means uh, the function omega minus is the solution of the Jacobi equation, namely of, of the equation Laplacian lambda plus uh, 2e k lambda equals zero. So lambda equals omega minus is the solution of that. Now, uh, if it's the solution of this equation, it's real analytic. However, uh, I had told you along here, I have already shown that it's a diffeomorphism. And from this fact, now I should tell you the third component, what is it? Uh, this is W and then one, two times two subdeterminant. This is just the Jacobian of the mapping F. Uh, so this is the crucial stuff. I want to estimate that this is this, is this stuff. Uh, I show that along here, not only that I have that it's a topological mapping, I show even that it's positive. Therefore, N3 is positive. I have no branch points over here. This is the convexity, and around branch points I would have an asymptotic expansion which would make the minimal surface not here, but in the image space overshoot, which is prevented by the maximum principle. And for that reason, uh, it turns out that this function omega minus I'm considering here is in a whole strip around this boundary identical zero. But it's the solution of an elliptic equation, so it's real analytic, so it's identical is zero. That means omega minus is zero. That means omega itself is greater or equal zero. And now you go back to this differential. Yeah, no, I leave it as you go back to this differential equation. Uh, you take the minus sign on this side. And uh, from this you see it's less or equal zero. That means N3 is superharmonic and greater or equal zero. So it has to be strictly positive. Now I know that N3 is positive. I know that N3 is positive. Uh, so this expression is everywhere positive except where I have branch points because their W disappears. And now I go on like this. Uh, having this, uh, I can prevent the overshooting stuff. Now, if the following happens, uh, if I have here G and the minimal surface here, it cannot overshoot. But if I would, it would overshoot over here or it would overshoot over there, well, then I have 
boundary points here or boundary points there. They correspond to certain points over here. Uh, I have a, a branch point expansion over here. Branch point extension always tells me a minimal surface looks locally like a disk or a multiply covered disk. So here is my disk over the plane or multiply covered. And the normal looks like this. And it never is perpendicular. It's always like this. So it projects down as a full ellipse. So uh, if I would have boundary points here, it would Im immediately overshoot here or overshoot there. But at the boundary, I cannot have branch points, as I show by other methods. So it cannot overshoot there, cannot overshoot there. So this is OK. Uh, now, all the other arguments are in a, in a similar flavor. And uh, this way, uh, this, so to say, the main step showing how one can actually hope to make this argument with this diffeomorphism work. So there are many subtle points, and, uh, uh, which I cannot go into the detail. And if you give me two minutes, I would at least uh, like to tell you about a special case of this, which is a singular case. So, in this singular case, I take the surface of this type. So this, if it were not an edge here, were rounded, my usual results I had given would apply. But now I have this edge, which is singularity. And then a strange phenomenon can happen. Uh, and a large part of our work we are doing now is to clear up what happens at such a singularity. And this is very subtle, because uh, things are not easily predictable what will happen. <laughs> Namely, <coughs> you could do the following. I draw two schematic pictures. Either you could have an arc which goes around from the outside, or you take an arc which goes inside. In the projection, it looks like this. So the minimal surface sitting in there would maybe, you would hope, would look like this, or you would look like this. And uh, our ultimate goal would be deriving a uniqueness result also for the singular uh, situation. Since this is a very simple kind of surface, we thought first this is the simplest case one could look at. It turns out it's the most difficult case uh, one could study because of this ugly singularity. And what actually can happen is uh, if it looks like this, then the minimal surface we can prove uh, under certain extra conditions, which I have no time to describe now, uh, sits in this angle and cuts through this real line transversely and orthogonally. That means the Gauss map points in this direction. However, if it goes around like this, uh, then it can happen that the minimal surface has a free trace which looks like this. Let's say it comes here, then it attaches for a while to the edge and then it moves off again. That means then the normal is like this. Of course, it's not at all clear that you have a normal, but these results have been proved. Uh, we have even proved that it's of class C1 plus one half. This is the optimal regularity you can prove. So you, and you have no branch points here, so it goes even as like a regular curve. First derivatives are a herd of continuous of exponent one half. So this is nice. So the normal is perpendicular. So you have two cases. And along the edge, either the normal in one point shows like this, or along a real line, it shows like this. And uh, what happens is, uh, if you look at this situation, 
and you would take a circle around here, intersecting the plane perpendicularly, and then you would take out what is inside, so remove this, then you have a minimal surface which is stationary, and you have this phenomenon. But as soon as you move these two points out of the plane in which they lie a little bit apart, in such a way that the parameter representation of this curve is a monotonic function of the height. Then we can show from asymptotic expansion immediately it has to attach to a whole line. That means you suddenly have a discontinuity of the normal. The normal jumps from this position to this condition. By arbitrarily small uh, perturbation you can have this jump over there. And if you look at it in a non-parametric way, it's a complete mess because uh, then you are over in, in a domain which looks like this and the surface goes in the non-parametric way perpendicularly over here. That means you have no prescribed boundary values over this point. You have a whole interval. And of course this is very bad to, to understand this in a non-parametric way. Only the parametric way will show you what happens. And you see really to understand it you have to look at the surface and the normal at the same time uh, to get the full picture. And I actually I want to give you a very concrete result and not reference to a theorem that this can happen. Uh, but I do not want to overextend your politeness. So thank you for attention.